This is Dentist Money. Now, here's your host, Reese Harper. Welcome to the Dentist Money Show, where we help dentists make smart financial decisions. I'm your host, Reese Harper, here with my trusty old bearded co host, <laughs> Sir Ryan Isaac. Hey, and welcome. Welcome to you, sir. You've been through a little bit of a, uh, what shall we say, uh, the old seasonal flu virus? Just the just the run of the mill routine, multiple flus and colds. For all of you who look forward to this episode, though, fear not. We have uh, beaten beaten him with a Nerf bat, and given him a shot in the arm of water. You didn't tell me what it was. <laughs> I, it was just water. Yeah. You're like, just take this. It does something for you, though. Water. And now you're all perky. Yeah. I am. And excited. I'm excited. He was good. He was sick for the last three or four days. Yeah. We had to haul him out of bed. Yeah. Um, put him in the back of my truck <laughs> and tie next him to down. The, next to the deer. We had to tie him down next to um, my four-wheeler and haul him in. Yeah. Which was actually <laughs> in the back of my truck, so it made for not a lot of room. <laughs> Anyway, it's good to be here, though. I guess the moral of the story is I'm glad to be here. I am glad to be here. Today's topic actually is another very important thing Mm -hmm. in our lives. Yeah, it's they are questions from our loyal listeners. Yeah. Once a month, uh, we do an episode. This is our second monthly version of the Q&A podcast. We did one last month. And it was Huge. one of our highest downloaded episodes of the last probably six months. And so we thought, okay, let's do it again. And we made a little push for some more questions. And we're actually getting good responses from people on Q&A. Some come from people clicking our website and submitting the questions on the contact page. Um, some people are emailing them directly. That's what we're kind of requesting that people do. Just send your questions yeah. in to Reese at DennisAdvisors.com or Ryan at DennisAdvisors.com and, and let it give us a chance to answer them. And the first one today, uh, I'll, I'll let you kind of introduce the first question. Yeah, so this comes from a general dentist, mid-40s. Uh, he's in uh, in the Midwest in the country. Uh, he's a single owner doc in the, in the practice, one location. And he says, I'm thinking it's time in life to consider financial planning. I've been going over options for an office retirement plan with help from your podcast, but not sure if I'm ready or what type of plan to use? Great question. Yeah, fantastic question. Uh, first of all, thanks for listening, and we're glad the show's offered some direction yeah. in your decisions. That's cool. You can listen to a podcast nowadays and get some help. Yeah. Ultimately, like from my perspective, the answer to this question has a lot to do with how much p- financial planning the person has actually done. I mean, if they've really not done anything and there is no liquidity in their uh bank accounts or, or there's no investment accounts and it's just kind of starting from scratch. I mean, they've paid off a lot of debt um, and they're sitting at a point where they're really contemplating their first retirement plan. Um, my immediate feedback would be, well, how much are you how much are you going to be able to save to put away into this account? Um, because if it's $3,000 a month, um, that's very different than if it's five or mm-hmm. seven or 11 or because if you've waited this long to kind of get started with financial planning, it's likely that you've been paying down a lot of your debts first. You've just been saying, look, the obvious thing for me to do is I'm just going to pay down all my debt. When I get that done, then I'll consider financial planning. Right. And th- that happens quite often. Yeah. And so I guess my answer would depend on the context of their their savings. Um, and, and if someone had a, I would say if someone had between three and $5,000 a month to save, I would be using uh, a simple IRA or a 401k plan, probably a deductible 401k. And I wouldn't be putting all of the money I had into that type of plan. Mm -hmm. I would be putting it into um, an after-tax account to build liquidity as well. And I'd want to have at least that three to six, uh, maybe even as much as nine months worth of cash of personal spending before I really started um, putting any more money into retirement. Because I want to see someone have a little bit of a fallback. That'd yeah. be my initial question. I don't know what questions, additional context questions you'd have. No, but I think that's great. I was going to point it to it. But let me comment on what you just said. We actually had an episode. It's uh, number 53 um, called Everything You Need to Know About Retirement Plans. And that, it kind of addresses what you're saying, where based on your situation, how much money's even left over, um, how to how to choose what retirement plan is going to work best for the office based on what is sitting around every yeah. month. You know what you have. Do you have three? Is it five thousand? I think 10, the default 000? is whatever I have, I should put in. 
to retirement that's what, specific that's accounts. That's what it seems like. Yeah, I've got three grand a month. It all should just you know you what? Know. And I'm kind of blown away. Like in my career, I'm 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 surprised at how often I come across someone at the latter point of their career when the o- and the only retirement money they have is what they've put into actual retirement specific accounts that are locked up until they're 59. Yeah, the 401k and a half. or yeah. the simple that goes There's up. people just don't think of retirement accounts as regular after tax investment accounts mm-hmm. as much. And it's it's not as or common need, or needing to do that throughout a career too. Yeah, it's like, well, I, if I'm going to put money away from retirement, I'll put in what the retirement plan maximum is. But they don't treat uh, an after tax savings account with the same level of yeah um, exactness. I yeah. mean, it, it's like it's not viewed the same. Yeah, like your mortgage, you have you have to pay three grand a month towards it, so you pay it. The four hundred one k requires eighteen thousand dollars and eighteen five, and so you you put you know fifteen hundred a month in. Yeah. But your after-tax account, since there's not an actual tangible number, it's it, for some reason people just don't actually commit to that. With that's the where same. I play around with my stocks a little bit. It's like I don't know what I do with that. <laughs> that's where I play around a little bit. Yeah, it's a, got a little. Got a and little I, stock I here. when I need money, I sure know where to grab it from, <laughs> yeah. and it's always from that account because easy which to is, get to. I mean, which is a part of the reason of having after-tax accounts, liquidity, it's totally to it. So. Yeah, episode fifty three will address what you're saying though. How how to pick the retirement plan based on what is actually left over for savings every month. I think that's the when when someone asks a question, I want to start financial planning. What product do I use? I think it's it feels intuitive and it's the easiest thing to just jump to. Let me tell you what product you yeah. should use. What account type? What retirement plan? What insurance policy? You know, depends who you talk to. Yeah, Dep- depending on who you're asking a question to, the default answer is going to be the easiest to go jump towards. Um, uh, the the product, I, but I think you address that well. Um, and then check out the episode fifty three if you yeah. want more detail on it. We, we if we backed up though, and we looked at the first part of his question where he says here, what was his exact, exact quote? He says, I, "I'm thinking it's time in life to consider financial planning." I I thought let's talk about that for a minute because that's kind of a whole other issue from what uh from the retirement plan that actually gets implemented. You know what product? So I thought. What is it like? Maybe we could just chat for a little bit. Tell him what is it like to be mid career, mid forties, and then start financial planning. You know, what yeah. are some of the questions that we're gonna? You know, I would say first it it means getting organized. You know, it's really similar to doing your exams and your X rays and taking your pictures and doing your hygiene, and your cleanings before you do diagnosis or treatment plan. Yeah. So in this case, it means understanding things like. What what is your net worth? What do you own? You know, what are the assets? What are the things you own? What are they worth? Um, what are your debts? Um, where does your money go? You know, the the middle row of our elements attracts. You know, do you, how much do you save? How much do you spend? What goes to taxes? What goes to debt? You know, where does your money go? Um, what kind of risks are you taking? What are your main goals? Are you trying to buy more practices? Are you trying to buy a house? Are you going to buy a building? You know, are you are those things behind you and you just need to accumulate money? Are you you know? So what what are the main goals you're trying to accomplish? Um, yeah, just I, I think that, that what you're highlighting right here to me is the most kind of misunderstood part of financial planning. Yeah. And it's amazing. Like, so good financial planning is being able to clearly understand your personal net worth at the drop of a hat and really understand what that means to you. Yeah. So net worth is a measure of what you are. Like when it, it tells you everything about when work will be optional for you, how secure you are, the how how hard you've been if, if the the hard work you've been putting in has resulted in more financial security. You know, it's it's not just this like fancy word that makes you you know sophisticated. It's it's like it just a simple. It's like taking your blood pressure and your cholesterol at different ages of your life and determining if they're out of range. It should be as easy as saying. I'm 47 years old and my net worth is $1.7 million. And we're in our office, we're actually getting to the point where we can say that's $300,000 below the mean, or that's $500,000 above the mean. We have hundreds of samples to look at and say, in your age band for your specialty, what is the net worth uh, that you should have for the amount of money you've earned in your life? You know, not like just your age comparing like a a 44-year-old um, orthodontist to a 44-year-old GP who has very different incomes. I mean, that wouldn't be a fair comparison, but right. we can compare people that have had the same lifetime earnings 
And we can say this person's earned $2.2 million throughout their lifetime up to this point in time. In and, dentistry, there's, and there's yeah. another sample of 40 people that have earned that same amount of money by this age or not by this age, but just to have earned that am- amount of money uh, in their lifetime in dentistry. And what should your net worth be? Like, what's the average person's net worth if they've earned this much mm-hmm. money? Because uh, some people might earn, let's say the average lifetime earnings of someone is $2 million. And that's what they've earned up to this point in their life. If you add up all the profits and distributions and salaries that someone's earned, they've earned $2 million. Someone might have earned that by the time they're 38. And someone else might have taken until they're age yeah. 50 to earn that. I mean, you don't, it doesn't matter what age you are necessarily. But you have this amount of earnings that you've had in your lifetime. You should have a net worth um, that is somewhere around the average of what other people who have earned that same amount of money have had. If you don't, that means you either spend way too much money and are really frivolous with your expenses, or it means you've made some big investment mistakes where you've had massive losses. That means there's been embezzlement or fraud. It means you haven't invested your money as uh, maybe successfully as your peer group. Um, but as a financial advisor and as a, you know, like if you go to a doctor, the doctor is able to at least tell you your blood pressure and cholesterol for your height and your weight, your height and weight, measure me- measurable things. Yeah. Your BMI, like these are, you're, you're in an okay spot and that gives you a lot of closure as a patient. Cause you're like, okay, I know There's I'm not data. the healthiest, yeah. but like I'm, you There's know, comparable data. I'm making improvements or yeah. I'm kind of within the median for where I should be. And with financial planning, I swear, it's like so speculative with most advisors. You go meet with someone and it's like you said, they literally just jump to a product recommendation. There is no planning. There's no planning being done. It's just you ask me a question about retirement account. I just give you a retirement account and we move on. Oh, you want a retirement account? I don't know. Okay. You want a 401k? Yeah, sure. I'll give you one. I got you. I got 401ks. I got simples. I got yeah, doctors don't do that. Like you go yeah. to a doctor and you'd be like, you know what? I'm kind of depressed. He's like, we'll have some Prozac. Yeah. It's like, we well, you need to kind of go through a little bit of diagnosis to determine if that's really a helpful yeah. medication. Well, the dentist isn't like, hey, I've got implants. I've got crowns. I've got, uh, you know. Yeah. I've got, a, I've got a whole bunch of stuff we can do. It doesn't just. It's like, no, I'm going to check first. I'm going to measure everything. I'm going to take pictures. I'm going to spend some time. Then I'll tell you specifically what you need to address all the other things we just got done doing. Yeah. I I just think that's really healthy. And I wish that um, more dentists could understand that the first thing you really should do is understand what your uh, net worth is and whether that is healthy for how much money you've earned up to this point in your life and then how much progress you should be making each year. Um, And and that way you can kind of hold yourself accountable every calendar quarter uh, to the amount of savings you should be putting away, the amount of debt you should be reducing and know that, hey, you're right on track. You know, yeah. the, the average dentist at your point in time is actually a little behind where you're at and good job. You've been you've been making more. And that way, I just feel like it lets you live life with a little less stress around your money because you feel like you're you're on track and your things are okay. All right. Question number two. This is, a, this is a good question. Question number two comes from a general dentist in his early 40s, kind of a West Coast region area. Um, he is a 50-50 partner in one practice location. So that's kind of some background here. Um, he says, hi, I'm a dentist of about 12 years and want to do something different from what I have been doing. I'm interested in what your fees are and whether you think I should get out of the product I am in. So those are kind of two questions. I thought you were going to go into, I want to do something from what I've been doing. Like <laughs> I'm already to pivot into a new career. <laughs> I've always enjoyed like, acrobatics. You know, I want to join That's the where we end. When it gets to, we can give career advice. Well, if only if you're wanting to pivot into something we understand, it can't be the circus. Do you want to coach a CrossFit class? I or just wait. Music? Here's what it was. I just saw. Um, what's that new musical about the circus? It's out on the, the Greatest movie. Showman. Oh. The Greatest Showman. Oh, okay. I just went to the Greatest Showman, and they actually want to start a traveling circus. You do. No, but I'm just okay. saying that's what I was it actually cool. thinking when you read that first line. <laughs> it was in the. It was in my subconscious. I was a little worried that we were going to do go something there. different. What career should I pivot to? <laughs> yeah. Trapeze. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you I love the, the trapeze. The greatest showman. His The second part of this question that's a little more specific, okay, was he says, I have a variable annuity that I have contributed to for about a decade. I have about 300000 in it, but it hasn't been performing very well, and there's a lot of fees. I am just wanting to do something different moving forward for the final years of my career and see if it would be worth to con- worth it to convert that old plan into something better. Okay. So that's the more specific question. 
Well, we kind of touched on this in episode 106 of The Truth About Annuities. Yeah, so our- pu- push pause, go download 106, The Truth, the, the stark truth about annuities. We Nothing but the truth. There's a little bit of upside, but I will be honest <laughs> with you and save some of you the time and say for most 41-year-olds, you should not own one. Most 40, probably not a reason. Yeah, this is a forty-one. The reason I'm referencing that is the the question. The person who answered asked this question was in their early forties. Um, usually, the reason people own these is not because it's a consciously good decision. It's um, uh, it's it's because someone got paid a lot of money to it's still sell fear. you one of these. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that all is lost and everything about it is horrible. Um, and we'll, let's go into that a little bit, but I would just generally say this isn't something you need to learn about cause you're missing out on it. It's something that you want to cautiously avoid until the, the very late stages of your career and only when recommended by someone who thoroughly knows your situation. Um, and it would be recommended under very rare circumstances. Yeah. And, or can you think of any, you I mean, might already I, have someone one. might be wondering about this, that would you say not at 41 that impl- implies maybe older and do you want to do you want to go into what the rare circumstance might be in well, case I, anyone's wondering? I think that there are certain situations where an annuity can be a reasonable consideration. Uh, one of those being uh, if you're at at the latter stages of your career, meaning you're at the point where you're going to you're approaching or already in retirement and you want to start withdrawing money from your accounts and you have you have some money and it's close to being enough, but it's kind of tight. Um, and you're not planning on really having anything left over, uh, at, uh, at the end of your retirement to pass on for inheritance, uh, to, that's not a big to concern. Family. Yeah. Legacy you're just, gifting. You're just ready to spend it all down. Well, there is an annuity, uh, an, an immediate annuity is something that allows you to put your money in it and an insurance company will guarantee a payment to you for the rest of your life. Immediate being the differentiator between, as opposed to this what's person called a deferred. That's, yeah, this person right. that's asking the question has a deferred annuity where they're accumulating uh, money in it. Um, and they could get their principal back minus some fees and penalties. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and the, the, the reality is that there's just, there is less expensive ways to accomplish lifetime income planning, um, but it won't have the same amount of uh, guaranteed closure that you'll get from an annuity. For example, if you had a hundred thousand dollar principal uh, and you were going to invest it in a liquid uh, mutual fund in tax-free or taxable bonds, uh, in today's environment, you might only make three or four percent in interest on that. And in order to get and and maybe that's not enough income off your hundred thousand dollars. Maybe you're trying to get five or six or seven yeah. percent. Well, if you if you give that money to an insurance company and say you can have the hundred thousand, just promise me that you'll pay me a payment for the rest of my life, and the, uh, that might be closer to that five or six percent withdrawal could be, rate. Yeah, and it could be as high seven. as seven. And so you might be able to have an insurance company guarantee you a larger uh, payment, and psychologically that might feel better. The alternative would just be, hey, even though your hundred thousand is only paying you three or four percent, you can yank out an extra three, two, or, two three. or three to make it be the same. And most likely you'll have more money at the end of your career because you're maintaining control of your own principal. And it gives you more flexibility and a little bit more liquidity. But even if you don't, you could still do the same thing just knowing that it might be gone at the end, just Mm -hmm. like it would be in an annuity. As soon as you annuitize and start taking payments, it's gone. Yeah. Can't get your principal back. So it might, it might be the same, but during that period of time, you have more control to say one month, I don't need as much. Or the next month, I'd need more because I'm going to take a trip or yeah. something. Yeah, I think you you're being the bank instead of giving your money to a bank. Be your you're, own bank. You're the own. You're the insurance company instead of giving it to an insurance company. You're going to create the opportunity for yourself to um, withdraw funds at your at a time of your choosing. Okay. So what about this person who already has one? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, the question you mean? <laughs> <laughs> the question we started with? Well, th- that was the second al- alternative we were mentioning was you, you, the only reason, the reason you'd want to go listen to this truth about annuities is if you're this person or if you are yeah. someone who are, is contemplating buying an annuity and you're at the latter stage of your career. Mm-hmm. In this case, the the problem with, uh, well, I don't, I don't want to say the, the problem, but that there's a lot of fees inside of this annuity. It's probably important just to understand them briefly. Yeah, I, I was going to take this from a, an angle of 
you, you could apply some um, some some questions to any product that you're thinking about getting into. It could be a 401k, an annuity, life insurance policy, a real estate investment, something. I just kind of, I thought, you know, this is a good question for people to to ask, bef- you know, as they're getting into, into something or maybe they already are and they want to kind of think through the process of do I keep going or do I get out of it? I was thinking, you know, what are, what are if you ask yourself, what are the expectations that you had when you bought this product or what are the expectations you have before you buy this thing? You know, is it tax deferral? You know, did are you looking to get into a certain product for that or do you already have one because that's the reason why you bought it? Was it safety and security? Was it guarantees? Was it the type of investment? Uh, was it something about cost or diversification? Did you buy it un- under pressure? You know, did someone pressure you to buy it? Was it a friend who sold it? Was it something you felt like you just had to? Did you buy it under a lot of uncertainty? You know, and so I think those are just like good questions to ask in the beginning, regardless of what the product is. And then, you know, in, in this guy's case, how did those expectations hold up? Did you, and, and he's kind of answering that, you know, he, he might've bought that under maybe some pressure, maybe, um, I don't want to lose money in the market. I want to defer taxes, something, but now he's saying, I think this thing's kind of expensive and I have money I can't get at. Yeah. And so I think that it's important to ask, like, what are the expectations you have? And then weigh that against, you know, if you already have the product, how have those held up, you know, or, or, or can they be fulfilled, you know, have the right expectations. And why are you it. saying that's important to ask those questions? Yeah. To, to really know, like to really understand like why you're actually doing this, you know, because someone might feel like, oh, I'm buying the annuity because I mean, of course, you know, it's the safety, security and tax deductions, whatever, but it might really be because they just don't understand how a market works and it just seems really scary. Okay. Or it might be because of that plus it's a friend or a patient who sells the annuity. So what you're saying is you have a lot of conversations with people that don't really know why they have what they have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And especially when it comes to annuities. Yeah. And a lot of times it sounds like one of the motivations was I don't really want to invest my money in this thing that's wild and crazy. That's usually a, a part, a really important part of a sales pitch for an insurance product is avoid the volatility of a market. So but, you're saying but that still get returns. So breaking it down, so people buy these because they typically want more stability. They want less, un, they want less volatility and they feel like the alternative is the stock market, which is a little too crazy. Yeah. That's what you're saying. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, and impl- I mean, I hear in the, in this guy's question kind of implied is, I've done this for a decade. I've put in three hundred thousand dollars, but it's just really expensive and not turning out to be what I thought, thought it would be. Yeah, and that is in part because in this last decade we've had incredible returns in markets. Um, but in in that podcast episode one hundred six was it where we talk about annuities? Some of those returns you're capped, you're limited. You don't get to participate fully in those things. That's how they provide guarantees. Yeah, I just had a conversation yesterday with somebody who's got a life insurance policy in a, that's similar to uh, this annuity, where it caps the return at ten percent per year. Yeah, and initially that sounded like a great idea. Well, yeah, yeah. It's but fine. last year when the market was up thirty, thirty plus, you know, twenty plus percent or thirty plus percent, depending on which global market yeah. you're looking at. Uh, your all your returns were capped at, at 10 and and that really affects your long-term return uh, because without last year in your 10 year average you're, you're looking at more of a four or five percent return instead of an eight or nine percent average annual return so it's just that one year out of the 10 year that made such a big difference these annuity yeah. companies know that and the life insurance companies know that and so by capping your return they know that statistically they will capture uh, the upside at the highest level during those years uh, when the market grows a ton. At quite a significant margin. Yeah, but when they say we cap it at 10 or 12%, they know that most of their customers are just going to say, that sounds great to me. Because mm-hmm. because the lowest I could ever get is zero. Yeah. So that's so why. all it does is compress the possible return down uh, to a much lower uh, band. You know, By taking the risk out of it, you just give yourself a more uh, conservative return. Yeah. Not necessarily bad, but once you add all the fees, uh, on top of that, um, like if you were just going to put your money in a standard mutual fund and earn three or 4%, you could probably do that for five basis points now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's 0.05%. It's basically free. Yeah. Once you start putting it in a product with guarantees like this, with special features, you pay for them. You pay for them. And I, I would say, 
these the in my opinion this is my opinion going out on a limb alert here. alert opinion. i don't think these products were actually invented to help people <laughs> all right boom okay these shut were, it down right now these were not invented <laughs> to help you they were invented to be sold to you in a very very compelling way that's somewhat confusing if if people if if insurance companies really really wanted to help people as their primary motive they would not make these so complicated but they're they're they are a clustered mess they could be easier <laughs> of fees they're a clustered mess of benefits and it and I don't want to say everyone, okay? Like 1% of insurance carriers out there really do offer a stripped down, simple, easy to understand annuity. No load, no commission. And and, yeah. they, and they have good investment products backing them. Yeah. But 90 plus percent are the most complicated thing you're ever going to analyze. As a financial advisor with over 15 years of experience analyzing these things, it still takes me multiple hours of research to figure out every product that I get put on my desk. Yeah. I mean, it's not a five minute job. It's like, okay, there's a 60 page brochure here mm -hmm. and I've got to figure out the fine print on every provision. And you'll have to call a customer service agent, uh, like different ones, uh, multiple times to get because a the, consensus yeah, story. Yeah, when you call the first person, you're like, no, there's no fees here. No, okay, no, we're good. You don't, you've been working here for like a month. So can you explain to me like why... Okay, you know, and you know, and unfortunately, a lot of these customer service uh, representatives aren't being compensated super well. They're just taking calls, yeah, probably to confuse. They probably are in, uh, consciously hired under those pretenses <laughs> so that they confuse people when you call in, and that might be part of the strategy. The plot is thickens. It's even look, more evil than I thought. If we just complicate the phone call <laughs> enough. People will just give up because the first it, line of defense. They're like they don't want to make fun of the person they're talking to because yeah. it's so confusing. So they're just like, fine. I just I don't understand it. You clearly don't. I'll just go back to work because I don't even know how to get in I already answers. Have it. Yeah. Anyway, I'll get off my. Uh, I'll get off. <laughs> anyway, I'll get off my frustrating uh, <laughs> rant rant here. But I just think it's important for people to Truth have alert. some insight into how frustrating it is for even financial advisors to analyze some of these products. Oh, yeah. And I just don't, I don't feel like people are sold these, they're, they're, they 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 were never invented to help you. Mm -hmm. it, they were just, they just weren't. I mean, it might've started out that way with a good intention day one, but this industry has evolved into something that's highly lucrative and really hard to unwind. And there's a lot of salespeople getting paid really well to keep doing this. So I, I would just stay away from annuities as a general rule Unless you have a really, really, uh, you've had one for a really long time, then in a lot of cases, there's a lot of analysis that needs to be done because you can adjust it. You can lower the fees. You can make adjustments. So let's talk about what this call, this question uh, that came in. What should this person do uh, given all this? Yeah, it's funny. You said um, how hard it is to do research from one product to the next. I'm actually, today, I have to do a call to um, unwind someone's annuity. And I just did one a week ago and they'll be totally different. You yeah. know, I can't use anything other than a set of questions. So I kind of wrote these questions down. What are some of the things I'm going to, I'm going to call an insurance company with my client on the line today. And here's a set of questions we're going to start to ask to try to figure out what this thing is. So some basic things are, and this is what this person would want to do. You'd want to get your, your company on the phone and you want to know, first of all, what type of annuity it is. Is it, is it um, what they call a qualified annuity, which would be like an IRA inside of an annuity, vice versa, or a non-qualified. Meaning, if the money came out of it, does it have to go back into an IRA? Do you have to roll it to an IRA? Or can I have the money? You know, yeah. can, it, can it be liquid? That'll tell you, that'll give you some idea about tax consequences, about liquidity, whether or not you can even get at the money. And it'll tell you how incompetent the original financial advisor was that sold this to you. I was going to let you cover that part. Yep. Because if it was inside of an IRA... <laughs> Double deferral. That was just a double really, deferral? really dumb thing to do. An IRA, de you're saying an IRA defers taxes, but an annuity defers taxes, but they don't double defer taxes. They just added a bunch <laughs> of expenses to something that didn't need that to was be already that happening. complicated. Okay. Um, I want to know what my basis is, meaning how much money have I put in to this thing? Kay. How much have I sent in, right? Yep. Uh, I want to know what the benefit base is. So there's a difference between the money I put in and the balance that they're going to pay my monthly payments from, that they're going to base it on. And and part of the way an annuity works, let's say I put 100 grand into an annuity. Um, that's my basis. That's what I put in. But they might pay me based on a balance of 110 or 120 or 130. 
And every so often, based on the kind of riders or um, provisions I have in it, they'll it's called a step up. They'll step it up. You know, they'll go from 110 to 120, even though I didn't put that in. That's kind of like, that's some of the incentive to keep you in it, right? Yeah. It's like, I only put in 100, but they're going to base my benefit on 130 now. And in fairness, even though it might not have been the best thing you could have done with the money, if you have a really, really high benefit base relative to what you've put in, yeah. you probably don't want to surrender that product. Yeah. And one of the biggest problems that I have with annuities is that um, most brokers end up rotating through these annuities instead of keeping you in the same one. So you'll go seven to eight wipe years out your benefit one, base. and they move you to a new one that has new features, but it wipes out your benefit base that you had and it cancels all the, the, the benefits you may have had for keeping your old one. Um, so it's really important that even though you, it's like, um, even though I may have bought a vehicle that isn't the best vehicle in the world, if I've driven it up to this point in my life, I might want to sell it uh, and get the cash out of it instead of doing it as a trade in and getting like a huge discount and not yeah. really getting my value out of it. Yeah. I think it's just, it's a similar experience. You can, you can, you can, you can try, you can, you just want to take advantage of something you've owned forever. Yeah. And, and not just waste it. Yeah. The, it's funny, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we have a client who had two annuities. They were pretty old annuities too. And one of them was that case where the benefit base was way higher than what he had put in there. Yeah. And so it was kind of like, eh, you know, you're going to get paid a withdrawal rate that's going to be higher than if you took the cash out and put it in an account. And Ryan sort of touched on this, but the benefit base, as you said, is the thing that you're your income is calculated from mm -hmm. when you go into withdrawal mode. Like when yeah. you go into, I want my money out mode, usually- Not money, uh, I want payments. I want my I want my payments out mode. Yeah. I'm ready to start taking distributions. Yeah. yeah. Then it's calculated from that benefit base, not the actual- What you put in. Surrenderable value that yeah. you'd get if you took the money out. Okay. So another question we'll be asking is, what is what, what, if we kept this contract, what's it going to pay us in the future? And what we're trying to figure out is what percentage of this benefit base are we going to get? Are we going to get four, five, six, or seven? And we can compare that to what we could do by ourselves, like you were saying earlier. If I just took my cash, um, if it's not dramatically different than the, the benefit base they're, they're using, then if I just took my cash and I could give myself a 4% withdrawal rate, is that similar to what I'm going to have in the annuity, but with way higher fees, no access to my liquidity, and very restricted investment options? So you want to just compare... Well, you know, what is, what is it going to pay you? You want to know things like how does how does it grow? How is it invested? Uh, that's a little bit harder to understand. Usually there's not many investment options. Usually yeah. they'll list like six of them. And there's like, it's all like US, like it's either the Dow Jones or the S&P. And then there's three different versions of them because you can either have full participation or partial participation with a cap. And yeah. <laughs> like what's crazy is that they're not like investments that you could actually compare to no, something you could specific buy. Specific to that annuity they, product. They're like they're, built for it. they're proprietary investments that built, that are yeah. inside of that annuity, annuity product and those carry their own costs. And, you know, that's another way that that you need that Ryan was saying, what are the investment costs? Yeah, is that a was a question. Yep. A lot of times th that's where the annuity carrier is making a lot of their money is they're actually... They've got a very, very expensive investment product that you're investing in. And it's theirs. They built it. It's their mm -hmm. product. So, And investment costs, we're talking in the range. Of, it's always over a percent. It's usually like one and a half to two, sometimes over 2% for those funds that you have access to in, yeah. in the account. Versus what you were saying earlier, you can go buy a mutual fund for 0.05% yeah. if you wanted to. And in fairness, probably there are... I, I only know of one to two carriers out there. TIAA Cref has a... An, an, an annuity where the the funds are uh, delivered close to or at cost mm -hmm. and they're not really making any money on the funds. Um, that's becoming a little bit more of a trend. I'm sure there's one or two other carriers that I haven't seen that are trying to do that right now. Um, but most and most of the time you'll see that the names of the funds are they're not something you could go and find on Google or research. It's yeah. going to be like uh, the enhanced growth Dow US uh, <laughs> focus fund. Yeah. And you're like, all right. It doesn't exist anywhere like, except for in your annuity. I have no idea what these guys are trying to do with this sleeve of investments. Yeah. And and consequently, I don't know how to pick which one I should have. 
And, and now then, they'll provide you a like a hundred page pr- prospectus, yeah, in a PDF on LLP. historical on historical results, yeah, which may not, but because a lot of these funds aren't uh, following like a, a really specific uh, repeatable strategy, it's difficult to use those historical results to say what is what's it going to be like in the future, yeah. Or um, some of I've seen prospectuses that literally are like it, it says like safe growth. Uh, and I'm like, okay. oh, good. <laughs> yeah, okay. Good. Thank you. That's awesome. Quite helpful. Anyway. So the other question we'll be asking are what are the main expenses in in the this product? Uh, the main one is called an M&E, mortality and expense cost. Um, that's usually, usually it's a one and a half. So I got these statistics. Um, it ranges between one and a half and 3% per year. That's on top of the, you know, typically one to 2% investment costs. And that is also still separate from what an advisor might be getting paid on top of that as well. Yeah. I mean, it'll be broken down typically into it'll it, it, M and E. Uh, what Ryan is saying is it's a generic term for a lot of different costs that get wrapped up in a product. You'll see some you'll see like four or five different costs that are uh, ranging from administrative fees to contract fees to um, distribution fees to marketing expense to uh, 12B1s to mortality and expense charges, which are most often related to the, that, like by definition, those should be more related to the actual insurance costs. Of yeah. the, the, this annuity typically will pay you a death benefit uh, that's either equal to what you've put in or equal to your benefit base or equal to your benefit base that would come out minus what you've taken out. I mean, it, so there's some, uh, features that you're paying for, but I'd be surprised if, uh, like in most analysis that I've done, it's at least, especially with the dental, uh, focus that we have, the products that they end up purchasing typically is between, I've never seen anything under 3% that I can recall all all in. in. Yeah. Oh yeah. And sometimes it's as high as five. Yeah. I mean, it just depends on how expensive the investments are yeah. and then how many features they've elected to receive. Mm-hmm. So it, it's just really expensive. And that's what you have to compare. You have to say, you know, if I took this this money myself, even if I paid a penalty to get it out, which is another question, if I took my money back, uh, what kind of penalty am I paying? Uh, usually that lasts for about 10 years. Yeah. Which is why the annuities get switched at about year eight or nine. Yeah. You know? So I know we spent a lot of time on this question, but I just think we should summarize it with saying like, be aware of all the penalties you pay. Yeah. Um, be aware of any taxes and tax effects that uh-huh. are going to uh, impact you on the growth. Because it's possible that the money you could pull out of it could be more than what you put in and you'd have a taxable event. Not likely, but possible. <laughs> it's very, every time I've seen that happen, it's literally like a couple thousand dollars. Yeah, after I've, a I've decade. never like I've seen. More hundreds losses, and hundreds though. of these, but I I rarely see one where I'm like, oh, you have more than you you've have put in. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah, it grew. It's grown. Yeah. Congratulations. It's crazy. So yeah, th- I, uh, that's a good list of questions to to start with. Yeah. To do some analysis and and, and switching, you just have to like moving out of it. Um, in many cases, unless there's a significant benefit base, and unless your fees are very reasonable. Uh, meaning, you know, all in, you're less than, you know, one and a half percent, um, which would be unlikely, but yeah. possible. And a high withdrawal rate they're going to give you. Yeah. And off of your benefit base, you're going to get promised a very high withdrawal rate. Well, I would say like tempting would be like six or above. Yeah. Yep. And if your benefit base, though, is much higher than what you've contributed. Than what you put in. Because to me, like withdrawing, like I don't know if like six, withdrawing six percent of my principal if life expectancy for males and females is somewhere between somewhere in your early eighties to late, late seventies to early eighties, depending on your health history, you really don't have like a super, like, I know everyone's thinking, I want to live till I'm 104, but no, you don't, you don't want to live that long. (laughs) Trust me. But the withdrawal rates, um, the withdrawal rates are, you know, often if you're taking six or 7% out of your benefit base and and they're promising that that's going to be for life, a lot of times it's just not that compelling given the average mortality of, of our lives. Mm-hmm. And so it just makes more sense to have the liquidity, enjoy your life in your early 70s, your late 60s. Keep access to the money. Keep access to the money, spend it down. And, and you, you know, you, you'll still have 
a lot of other, hopefully you have other income sources that can be there to guarantee the longevity of, of your, in, in case you, you're, you know, you live a lot longer than you'd expect. Mm-hmm. But I mean, honestly, like my, my, in my experience, most people that are living into their mid eighties or late eighties, these are kind of the worries that people have. Like their, their standard of living's gone down so much yeah, at that point spending and, yeah. and their spending's decreased so much that a lot of times most people are they're doing quite well on social security plus yeah. a little bit of i mean their debts are gone like it's just not a really expensive time mm-hmm. and so i worry that a lot of people end up annuitizing principal going on a fixed income in in the point in their life when they really want to enjoy their their money most because mm-hmm. retirement really is a a spend it earlier in retirement and spend less later kind yeah. of that's the that's the typical yeah. you know spending pattern is we spend more early and we spend less later. So why would I want to go to a fixed income early in my retirement and not have the flexibility to spend extra money on things I really enjoy? Okay. So uh, yeah, that was good coverage of what to do with your annuity. Again, um, we should say that if anyone ever has more questions, if someone's listening and they're like, oh, but I have more follow-up questions, call us. 833-DDS-PLAN. Go to dentistadvisors.com. Click the link at the top and you can schedule a call so we can go into more detail. Yeah, or, and submit questions about all of this stuff. Again, this is the Q&A episode. We just want to make sure we get um, all of your, want to get a variety of questions pretty consistently. I'd also love to hear from more uh, women dentists. Uh, it seems like we get more uh, male dentists sending in questions. Um, the statistics are pretty compelling right now that more women are getting involved in dentistry than men coming out of school. Oh, yeah. And we need to, I just want to continue to hear from their perspective on a yeah, lot of these questions sure. as well. Cause I, 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 it seems like we get a disproportionately high percentage of, uh, male questions coming. Maybe in, the so. women already know the, all the answers. They probably do. A lot of the men are just sitting around. They're and, smarter. Yeah. That's it's true. not sarcasm either. I believe <laughs> that. Okay. So finally question number three, this comes from a general dentist, um, back on the East coast mid thirties. This is a, um, single location, uh, one owner in the practice looking to grow in the future. It's kind of some background. Uh, he asks, he says, I have a brokerage account instead of doing a Roth IRA or backdoor Roth for both myself and my wife. Is this the right thing to do? And what would be the reason for doing this? He's asking, why am I doing a brokerage account instead of uh, a Roth IRA? Let's try to answer this one in um, terms of like, when is the appropriate time to do a Roth IRA conversion or what's it's also known as a backdoor Roth IRA? So I don't think it's better to pay taxes now all the time. It's not always better to pay taxes today. If you have a large IRA balance and you're already in the highest federal tax bracket, meaning your taxable income's in the 400 plus range, it's not likely that you'll have that high of income in your retirement because you're only spending, we'll call it 150 to 180,000 a year. Yeah. Most people. So, so you're, in retirement, your income is likely going to be 150 to 200,000. Yeah, you're a year. saying today in your working years, you have to pay taxes on everything that comes in. In the future, you just pay taxes on whatever you take to live on. Yeah, so it's just which a is lot. likely to be less than today. And so it's it's not. I think it's really bad advice to just tell people pay taxes now. Taxes are always going to go up, and it's never going to get cheaper. And look at our government's problems. And it's true. Like we have a massive federal deficit. And we just cut tax rates right now. And the the best estimates are we'll still have more deficit when if we If you're get listening done. to this podcast um, like 10 years from the, the original air date. Yes. You'll the, know. The best estimate is we'll still have more federal deficit. So, I mean, at some point, tax rates will increase. But if the last 50 years are any indication of what's going to happen likely moving forward, it's that there will always be some level of a progressive income tax where people who make more pay more. And so if you're going to be spending less in retirement than you are, uh, if you're going to be pulling out money in the future, like Ryan said, that that's going to make your income be lower than it is today because yeah. today you're paying taxes on everything. So when do you do a backdoor Roth? Well, it, it makes sense to do a backdoor Roth if you've maxed out all of your other uh, tax deductible options, meaning you're doing, uh, you, you're you're putting as much money away as you can into tax deductible retirement, whether that's profit sharing or uh, 401k deferrals or defined benefit plan contributions. That could be as much as, you know, a hundred plus thousand a year though. Yeah. If you're already doing all of that and you still have excess money that you're going to put in an after tax brokerage account anyway, 
then it does make sense to take at least $11,000 of that, yeah. put it into a non-deductible IRA, and then convert that to a Roth IRA uh, every year. That's currently still legal mm-hmm. and possible. I think the that's we're just saying instead of putting money in an after-tax brokerage account, uh, put it in this backdoor Roth. But I probably wouldn't do I, the other situation where I might do a backdoor Roth is when someone's got an income that's like just right at the threshold of um, they're they're right at the threshold of uh, you know not being able to qualify for a Roth, but it's just barely above it. Yeah, because. Your income, your taxable income is going to be quite low still there, so it might make sense if you don't have a lot of savings and you don't really want to do a 401k yet in your early career, and you already have a bunch of money in a Roth, and you're just going to save ten thousand a year. It, it might make sense for someone yeah. in a really uh, l- when you have a little, just a teeny little bit of money, not not a lot. You're not saving three, four, five grand a month. You're saving a thousand a month. Could, I could see it making sense yeah. there potentially. Yeah. But, it, but that won't be a, a lasting thing, most likely. You'll, yeah, it'll go away at some point. It'll only be a few years that you'd do that. And you wouldn't say to take your after-tax money and put it into a, a do a Roth IRA conversion at the expense of having some liquidity. No. Because you can't you can't really access that money very easily without causing ta- penalties and everything. So in, in situations where our clients are doing back to Roth IRAs, there are situations where they're they're maximizing the most efficient plan for that year, the most efficient pre-tax retirement plan for that year, and they're building and have adequate liquidity accounts, meaning brokerage accounts they can have access to. What was our liquidity podcast? We just did this. You can listen to it. Well, episode 112, uh, where we talked about liquidity, that would give you a good idea on how to t- determine how much to keep around and how much you need. So we wouldn't say do it at the expense of putting some money in liquidity. And keep in mind things that are maybe more short term. I mean, do you need to buy a house? Are you going to move? Are you going to build a building? Are you trying to expand to multiple locations? Um, I think that the, this the, this person who asked the question said that, that that's kind of like their ultimate goal. So at some point, you're going to need a, a, uh, enough liquidity for a bank to give you loans to keep expanding. So you wouldn't want to lock away money that you're going to need for liquid purposes. So you can check out 112, episode 112, to go into more detail about that. So I just wanted to clarify, we wouldn't say do it at the expense of building liquidity. No, we wouldn't. But I, and I'd also say there's probably not any reason not to do it. If you have adequate liquidity yeah. and you're saving money in an after tax account, um, that it's not, a, it's not as big of a windfall as people feel like it might be. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about... Well, you can only put a small amount every year. Yeah, you can only put, a, you know, right now, $5,500 into each... But if you did that, you know, for a good solid couple decades between you and a spouse, I mean, it that's a significant... I mean... It's hundreds it's of thousands of dollars. That are, yeah. Yeah, it's just not millions of dollars, yeah. most likely. Um, and so, you know, you start... You start by the time that um, you've built liquidity, got your debt to a manageable level, and that you've paid down... Um, and you've made meaningful pre-tax contributions to bring down your tax rate in your most high income earning years, you're probably, you're going to want some after-tax money because if if you want to make work optional uh, before, you know, to have the option to, to slow down and maybe uh, slow back off of work in your late fifties, that Roth IRA money is not accessible till you're 59 and a half anyway. So you want to have a meaningful amount of and a half. after-tax money, yep. you know, but besides just locking it all up and pre-tax in the Roth. So okay. I like it. I I, I just think yeah, it's probably, fans. we get calls about this and texts about this quite often. And I think once we explain the trade-offs, uh, most people realize, okay, I probably don't have enough liquidity and I'm probably not maxing out my pre-tax accounts uh, at the, the level I should. And then clients who are definitely have them. Yeah. So it, it definitely comes into... It's like algebra. There's an order of operations. Yes. Was that algebra? I think it was geometry. Really? <laughs> oh, man. All right. Well, let's not end with math then. Let's do a proof real quick. <laughs> oh, I hated proofs. I loved math, but I hated proofs. Proofs are not math. Okay. And I refused to. Like, it was they, like mathematical were, philosophy. Yeah, we were taught that they were, but it is not. I loved math, man, but I hated proofs. <laughs> yeah. I just remember that part of my math uh-huh. life. All right. As Reese mentioned, please send us your questions. Uh, you can email uh, those questions to us. You can email Reese. It's R-E-E-S-E at DentistAdvisors.com or email me, Ryan at DentistAdvisors.com. 
Uh, check out the Dennis Money Show on YouTube. You can see which socks we're wearing, right? Yep. That's a really important thing. Um, schedule free consultation if you want to talk to us. Uh, if, if you have some more questions, you want to dive into some more detail, you want to talk about your situation or see what it would be like to get help from a financial advisor that um, knows your situation and knows dentists, then go to dentistadvisors.com. There's a link at the top of the page. You can click on that and that's our calendar. So you can pick a day that uh, works for you and we'd be happy to talk to you or call us 833-DDS-PLAN. And thanks everyone for listening. Carry on. <laughs>